Good morning. Good morning. Today we are going to discuss immune suppression, but by another style. Today it is an interactive tutorial. So I'm going to highlight and discuss 14 questions. Some of them are cases and some of them are direct questions. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. So if we start with the antibody therapeutics in kidney transplantation, these are four statements. Only one statement is correct. Basiliximab is the most common induction therapy in the United States. Basiliximab is associated with higher incidence of rejection, but superior graft survival in African Americans in comparison to ATG. Edis, do you hear about Edis before? No. I think so. I think it is uh, uh, brand new. It is, is an effective drug to get rid of anti HLA antibodies, respective to the complement 1Q binding the property of the antibody. So, anti complement 1S has nothing, has nothing to add to eclizumab. Uh, do you like to answer this question? If you don't know it is, you can expect, you can uh, guess the answer, which is the, uh, the right statement. Uh, I believe the right one is uh, three. That is an effective drug to get rid of uh, anti-HLA antibodies that respected to 1Q binding. Let us go to the stream of uh, uh, presentation and to find the answer at the end. So if we look at the induction therapeutics strategies, within the United States. Here, as you see, the green color here reflects the cell depleting antibodies. So the majority of transplant centers in US are using anti globulin or ATG because this assures the surgeons, nephrologists for the immediate uh, short time after transplantation. Okay, and the use of basiliximab because here, this is the basiliximab, the, this color, it's approximately 20% currently. So 20% of induction therapy is based on basiliximab. And the majority of induction therapy is based on anti uh, thymocyte globulin or ATG. In African American, this is one of the very large studies, including a large number of patients of African American. And if you look at this PAR system, in comparison to uh, basiliximab or interleukin 2 receptor and antagonists, in the past we have daclizumab that was vanished because of economic constraints. And so the majority of interleukin 2 receptor antagonists nowadays used uh, is basiliximab. Here, if you look at the six months rate of rejection, this is the rate of rejection, acute rejection rate. Uh, within the six months, as you see, the use of cytolytic induction is superior to basiliximab. After one year, the same. Uh, unadjusted overall rate is the same. Adjusted uh, estimated rate is the same. So this means that the use of depleting uh, antibodies are more potent than the use of basiliximab in prevention and in managing and preventing rejection. And this slide shows that here all the data are in favor of the use of cytolytic induction therapy. And the data, including acute rejection, as I mentioned here in the PAR system, as well as graft loss and the patient death. So using cytolytic induction is, is superior regarding the incidence of rejection, regarding graft survival and the patient survival in African American in comparison to anti hla and anti uh, interleukin receptor antagonist. Let us go to the ADIS because it is the most important. For me, it's striking news. This is, the ADIS is abbreviation of IgG driving degrading enzyme. So it is specific for IgG antibodies to degrade them. Okay? And it is derived from streptococcus biogenes. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, this is the data of pilot study uh, done between uh, Sweden and the United States, and the idea of using it is, is this is the complete IgG. If IgG is 
complete in its, in its structure. It can stimulate complement, uh, and uh, it can lead to antibody-dependent cellular site toxicity as well. So it's, it leads to CDC positive mm -hmm. and antibody-dependent cellular site toxicity positivity. Right. What it is has, as you see here, this is single cleavage of IgG. If you look here to the heifer chain, it starts cracking here. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it will lead to complete uh, division of the IgG. When the IgG is divided by this way, IgG lost its capacity for CDC and antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So it is fantastic drug. It was tested in this pilot study and shown effective in depleting anti chill antibody. This is a part system reflecting main fluorescent intensity by the color, the red color. And this is before it is, and the blue one is after. What, what do you see? It is approximate complete elimination of IgG antibodies immediately. And this is for uh, C1Q binding chill antibodies. Here, all these are before and after the drug, no antibodies. So it is potent for all anti chill antibodies, either binding complement or not. So it's very striking. And the news in the nature, uh, stressing upon the value of EDIS. So, if you look at all green colors, are potential benefits of using EDIS to disrupting the anti chill antibodies, decreasing the receptors. So, all these are fantastic. But if there is any problem to think of, yeah. there are some problems. Can you can you expect any problem? Uh, like the if it, if it destroyed all the available IgG, what about the immunizations before? Because most of the immunized or the already performed all the uh, immunoglobulin against the first infection is formed as IgG. Uh, so if you are destroying your loss defense against this infection. Okay, so it is specific for IgG. If the problem in IgG immediated uh, antibody response, it will not help. This is a point. Another point. We don't give it is alone. It is given in the context of rituximab and other antibodies like here. If you look at this map, you will find a lot of antibodies are given to desensitize the patients. If you give alemtuzumab or other antibodies, what will happen to these? All these antibodies are IgG. Mm -hmm. So it, the efficacy of other antibodies given with EDIS will be decreased mm -hmm. significantly. And this is another point. Mm -hmm. And as I said, IgM-mediated response will not be affected by EDIS. But I find it is intelligent idea. And uh, another problem is we can develop anti-EDIS antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, that may affect the efficacy of this drug. So we are uh, looking forward to seeing results of new studies regarding this point. But I found it a striking news uh, and a dream for highly sensitized patients to find a resolution for, even if this is for immediate short-lived uh, response, this is a dream for all highly sensitized patients. And we are looking forward for uh, the further results, further studies in this issue. Another study for anti-complement 1S anti complement 1S, this means that antibody will react on the proximal limb of complement activation. Because all of us are aware with eclozumab. Eclozumab works on? Complement 5. So it is the terminal. And if we block the terminal component of the complement, then we are leaving the proximal limb of the complement activation. Leaving proximal complement activation may lead to inflammation and damage of the kidney. So it seems that it is possible to use the proximal blockade of C1S. This is a phase one study. Phase one study means in volunteers. So we are waiting a lot of studies in these issues. So you, your answer was right so regarding the ADIS, but you just expect and imagine but this this is a scientific ground beyond the your choice so what uh, does this book it added to the plasma exchange and plasma exchange uh, i'm getting rid of all the immunoglobulins but but there is a limiting 
capability and the potency of plasma exchange. If you have a patient who is highly sensitized, with very high level of antibodies, donor-specific antibodies, sometimes we do plasmapheresis for several times, and the results are unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. But this is single dose of this degrading enzyme get rid of all IgG. So it is it's a real advantage and a real addition to the armamentarium of management of highly sensitized patients. But as I said, we are waiting for further proven effects in the coming studies. Okay. Regarding maintenance immune suppressive drugs, this is a state of uh, the situation of the use of maintenance immune suppression in the United States. As you see, if we look at calcineo inhibitor, what will happen? What happened? There is the vanishing of cyclosporin that is replaced by tacrolimus. The majority of patients who are transplanted nowadays in the United States are treated with tacrolimus. And this is a real addition to the immune suppression because here in our center, at the and Free Center, the, according to the last report published by Professor Gunaim, we found that the most important uh, and the, the most satisfactory long-term uh, survival was uh, achieved by the use of tacrolimus based immune suppressive regimen. So this, uh, so this is the point. If we look at antiproliferative, the same, other cerebrin is vanishing and is replaced almost by microphenolic acid related uh, protocols, either MMF, Celsept, or Myfortic. So this is the situation. But uh, I think other cerebrin has its role in uh, treating uh, pregnancy, yes. Or intolerating, or, or MMF is very intolerated by severe diarrhea. At this point, we may shift it to other cerebrin. But as I mentioned, the majority of antibiotics used are mycophenolic acid based. Regarding immature inhibitors, uh, in the beginning, there was uh, relatively high percentage of patients who are treated with immature inhibitors in the early uh, 2000s. But as you see, either at the time of transplantation or after one year, uh, it, it seems that it's less, five, less than 5% of patients are maintained on immature inhibitors. This may be because of the side effects of this class of drugs. Regarding steroids, as we adopted here since four years in our center in Mansoura, the steroid avoidance or rapid uh, steroid, uh, steroid withdrawal within the first week for low immunologic risk and for children to allow growth. This is the trend in the United States. Two thirds of patients, either at the time of transplantation or at one year, uh, uh, are maintained with a steroid, and one third steroid uh, withdrawal or rapid steroid withdrawal. And this is for the children, the same scenarios, because we want to allow children to grow uh, safely. Regarding steroid withdrawal, do you know if there is any long-term data about rapid steroid withdrawal? Like 10 years, 15 years, do you know? Yes, Here from the center, we have five years and something like that. But uh, what's your expectation for 15 year withdrawal? Follow-up of the rapid steroid withdrawal. Does it work or there is a problem or there is beneficial effects? Uh, according to the selection of the patient, or they are selecting the patient right, so they will keep the same advantage uh, that was proved at the five years by having lower side effects. So this is your expectation? Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is very rational and it was proven from this study. This is the data from Minnesota. 15-year outcome from rapid discontinuing prednisone study. And they observed that there, the, in this study, there is no significant difference in graft and patient survival, but with the benefit of avoiding excess side effects of steroids. Cushnoid, metabolic derangement, viral infection, all these are uh, significantly lower in rapid steroid discontinuation. Again, I agree with your statement 100%. We should stratify the patients who are suitable for steroid withdrawal. If we are dealing with high immunological risk, we cannot advise at all for steroid uh, withdrawal. This is a very interesting point regarding the continuous manifestations of immune suppressive drugs. 
And this is an article that is published in this month in the American Journal of Transplantation about continuous toxicities of immune suppressive drugs. I want you just to specify the sign you see and just to mention drug incriminated in this sign. Yes. Dr. Ahmed? Here uh, there is a hair loss or alopecia. If, if I ask you uh, which immune suppressive drug of the maintenance the armamentarium yes. is famous of this side effect. The drug that's famous uh, is tacrolimus. Tacrolimus, yes, I agree with you. Uh, and Dr. Ahmed? This Hello. is uh, hirsutil. And uh, if we the ask... The accused uh, drug is uh, cytosporin. Yes. So they, uh, I bought this uh, slide, slide by these photos just to say that although tacrolimus and cyclosporin are calcineurin inhibitors, but there is some differential side effects between tacrolimus and cyclosporin. And this is a florid example. Alopecia with uh, tacrolimus and the herstism with cyclosporin. And this, Ahmed? It looks like acne of steroids. It is sebaceous hyperplasia of cyclosporin. Mm -hmm. And if you read the article, this is a very nice article because if you read, you will, you will know how to deal with this patient if you have cyclosporin-related sebaceous hyperplasia. I, I recommend uh, you to read this article. And this is gum gum cyclosporin. cyclosporin. And the, the uh, magic solution is doing a good hygiene. Uh, for these patients or at the end we shift. If this is a slide, mm -hmm. uh, can you say what is this sign? Skin peeling. Skin peeling, acne, yeah. and this is ulceration, mm -hmm. and this is lymphedema. 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 All these side effects are related to inventory mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so should be ca careful about the drugs. Uh, this is from Professor uh, Saad Al Ghamdi presentation within uh, the CME transplantation course that was organized by Professor Adel Bakr on the last July in Cairo. And this is one of his slides. This is a lesion nodule uh, with, uh, over the left medial uh, malleolus. The teaching point here, if you have this lesion, we should go through the diagnostic approach, including even biopsy. And the biopsy reveals fungal infection. So this is a verticillum species of skin infection. And when we diagnose the uh, fungal infection, the treatment will be antifungal. This is, will be the curative for this patient. Another interesting point is high tacrolimus clearance. Can we diagnose it without doing genotyping? How? Uh, by calculating the dose and the uh, level, the relation or the ratio between the dose and the level, and at a specific amount, if it is more than uh, 1.5. Yes, you are right. It seems that you read the article. Mm -hmm. So the uh, when when we divide the daily dose <coughs> per milligram by the trough level per uh, nanogram per ml or microgram per liter, if it exceeds 1.5 unit, this means that the patient to achieve a target level, the patient uh, consumes larger dose of the drug. Mm -hmm. The high tacrolimus clearance, if we know the characteristic of the patient, this patient is clearing tacrolimus highly, this is a bad news yes. because it, it puts him in a risk of rejection and etc. So we should be careful at least by optimizing the dose and the targeting the level. And I think in the future, the study in the genetics may help in this issue. And this is why we have MD thesis of uh, Dr. Mohamed Mashel studying the gen genotyping for tacrolimus. Let us go to an interesting clinical point of tacrolimus. Tacrolimus variability. What's meant by tacrolimus variability? It means uh, variant dose in the same person. Yes. As, uh, some person who can who could receive the high dose as the first. So Is it harmful? Yes, as he may suffer from rejection or from toxicity. So the problem of variability, as you see in this slide, is variability. Either you have under immune suppressive episodes, and if you have under immune suppressive episodes, you will be left with an autoimmune response, antibody rejection, if the graft loss. This is the access. Or over immune suppressive episodes, because variability means up and down. So if it's up and the level is high, this means you are over immune suppressing your patient. You, so at the end, you may have the, all these side effects, including 
post transplant diabetes, infection, malignancy, and the major uh, adverse cardiovascular events, and even mortality. But be careful uh, when you look at this slide. Here you have here solid uh, squares, and uh, here interrupted and interrupted line. All solid square and the solid line refer to solid evidence base. But the interrupted lines, it needs a further proven in status. But again, we don't like variability. How to avoid variability is to optimize the use of the drug. It's to be taken away from food, because food leads to reduction of variability by 30%. And the most important point in variability is sometimes the patient take the drug today with food and tomorrow without food. This will lead to variability. So we should educate our patients. This drug should be taken away from food. If he is interrogating the drug in this manner, we give it with food, fix. but we we'll fix it in this situation and monitoring the level well. Yes. Okay, let us go to the sixth question. This is a patient who presents with graft dysfunction. Graft biopsy was done. And I want you to just to uh, explore the finding in this pathology. So it, uh, it shows uh, some. Uh, what is the abnormality you may you, some you see? Hyalinosis, nodular hyalinosis around the uh, the artery. This is some hyaline materials. The only word which is not uh, perfect around uh -huh. it is hyalinosis of the feather, uh -huh. and uh, the hyalinosis here is nodular hyalinosis. Starting from adventitial side and reaching the media, mm -hmm. so it is medial nodular sclerosis mm -hmm. of the vessels. Mm -hmm. This is PS stain and this is silver stain. You see the fascinating appearance of nodular hyalinosis. Mm -hmm. My question to you is: nodular uh, hyalinosis of the vessels is restricted only to calcium inhibitors. So it is cal this is calcium inhibitor related nodular hyalinosis. Mm -hmm. Is there a deficient diagnosis or it is restricted to this maybe, uh, syndrome? Maybe hypertension or diabetes. How to discriminate? Uh, according to whether the hyalinosis reached the media or not. So uh, the hyalinosis of the hypertension starts with intimal side surface. And after that, it can extend to media. But here, it starts with adventitial side and reach the media. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you have advanced hypertensive changes, you'll find at the end all the fine and the same. Mm -hmm. But we should think of the calcium inhibitor. And I, I'll present this slide that shows a very interesting figure for me. Here, yes, hyalinosis, severe hyalinosis is bad. And drastically affects graft survival. Clear? Yes. I think all of us agree about this point. Mm -hmm. But look here at this figure. The presence of arterial hyalinosis mild degree is associated with better graft survival in comparison to absence of hyalinosis. Mm -hmm. Is there an explanation for this? Yes, yes, there is explanation. Because the presence of mild degree of hyalinosis may reflect adherence, adherence of the patient to the calcium inhibitor. And the absence of hyalinosis may reflect non-adherence. And non-adherence to immune suppressive drugs is one of the most important problems and incriminated in the majority of cases of chronic antibody rejection, especially in adolescents and females, etc. So we should educate our patients to be adherent uh, to the treatment. Mm -hmm. This uh, patient who is a transplanted, and, if you, uh, the, uh, and after uh, transplantation, he presents with severe hypertension, uncontrolled, and hyperkalemia. His protocol of immune suppression included is uh, tacrolimus. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we say it is tacrolimus related hypertension and hyperkalemia, which drug is uh, the best to solve this problem? Is it cyazide, furosemide, bumetanide, acetazolamide, amlodipine, lucertan, or carvedilol? Cyazide. Why cyazide? Um, because cyazide is blocking the uh, sodium chloride co-transporter. Uh, increasing the delivery of the uh, Where? sodium to in the uh, distal tubules, so this will increase the delivery of sodium to the collecting ducts and increase the reabsorption of sodium and excre and excretion. Your the answer testing. is only missing the uh, the first statement mm -hmm. to specify why we think of cyazide because the chromos works on sodium chloride co-transporter on the distal tubules. So this is the figure. 
Tacrolimus works here on this circumferential tubule. It potentiates sodium chloride co-transportation. So it will lead to uh, 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 more absorption of salt. So it will lead to salt sensitive hypertension. And if sodium is reabsorbed uh, by this uh, intensity from the distal tubule, the amount of sodium rich in collecting duct, collecting tubule will be reduced. And when sodium rich in the collecting tubule is reduced, the stimulus for potassium secretion is missed. So potassium will be retained. So this will lead to hyperkalemia. If we want to solve the problem of the colomus induced hypertension and hyperkalemia, we should look at the pathophysiology. The drug that works sodium on chloride. the sodium chloride co-transporter within this circumvertibule is not low diuretic. It is thiazide. So this is why thiazide is the proper choice. Another case, this a kidney transplant patient who presents with nine years of persistent disabling bilateral foot pain. And the immune suppressive protocol included cyclosporin, trough level within this window, 50 to 75 nanogram per milliliter, everolimus, and steroid. What's mm -hmm. your thing? What, what, what is the differential diagnosis of bilateral bone pain in a kidney transplant patient? Treated to immune suppressive, this immune suppressive protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, osteoarthritis, uh, yes. peripheral neuropathy, okay. and uh, maybe a drug uh, side effect. Okay. Mm. If I want to restrict it to side, the drug side effect, which drug? C9. Uh, what is the mechanism of C9 induced bone pains? Let us go to the data. This is the MRI. MRI of the case ex explore and verify some points. So we want to know if, if there a vascular necrosis or not. Mm -hmm. So this MRI, 1.5 Tesla for the ankle, showing some just bone marrow edema, nothing else, no necrosis, nothing. The the pain is bilateral, mm -hmm. not unilateral. So unilateral usually with, with infection, gout, etc. And there is no deformity in the in the in the foot to say dystrophic changes. So and uh, so we are left with drug. Drug, as you mentioned, it is cyclosporin. The most interesting here in this case is cyclosporin in within the window, the window or low target cyclosporin. <clears throat> yes, bone pain can occur with cyclosporin or calcium inhibitor from one to five percent of the cases and may occur with uh, high dose or high target or even within target uh, level. And the mechanism is calcium inhibitor induced vasoconstriction of the bone vessels. So the treatment is either some, some authors or some doctors give amlodipine because amlodipine is vasodilator. So it vasodilates the bone vein and the bone vessels. So it can ameliorate bone vein or lowering the dose in this case, the dose is already on the lower side because the level is, is low, a little bit low, low level. Mm -hmm. So, the, and after giving amlodipine, the pain doesn't resolve. But after discontinuing the cyclosporin and shifting to MMF, the pain is completely resolving. And the MRI re repeated after a period of time showing uh, the absence of uh, bone marrow edema. So this is the bone pain syndrome induced by calcium inhibitor. It is calcium inhibitor induced bone pains, SIPS. And the guidelines that is released in this year in February show that the suggestion is to reduce or withdraw calcium inhibitor should be considered in kidney transplants with intractable bone pain. But as you see, it is suggestion based on uh, low level of evidence because uh, there is no randomized studies in this issue. Dihydroviridine calcium antagonist also may be beneficial. Again, it is suggestion based on low level of evidence. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you may be obliged to discontinue the drug completely and to be replaced by other drugs. Here I mentioned a lot of side effects related to calcium inhibitor. Does it mean that I am pushing and encouraging to get rid of calcium inhibitor altogether from the immune suppressive armamentarium, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. But I am 
I am believing in refining refinement of the dosage because we got the lesson because we start acrylamides in this center from since more than one and a half decade and we found in the earlier beginning we are accustomed to use high dose targeting a high level and at the time we witnessed a major side effects including tremors diabetes etc but when we, when we refined the drugs and using the current recommended levels and uh, referring to the low target nowadays we are enjoying the using the acrylamus in transplantation and this is the very recent uh, systematic review and meta-analysis done by the Cochrane River Group, including 83 studies involving 16 sound patients, showing that it is very difficult to get rid of calcium inhibitors because use of calcium inhibitor is uh, strong and potent immune suppressive drug against rejections, and we are waiting further studies uh, in this domain. Let us go to a very interesting point regarding the use of mycophenolic acid in child bearing period women and in men who are seeking to be fatherhood. Is there any problem in women and the men for the usage of mycophenolic acid based immune suppressive drugs? Yeah. Dr. Ahmed? In the past, uh, it was a custom that only the female who should receive uh, contraception if they receive uh, MF during child bearing period. But uh, currently, there are new reports uh, and the FDA also. Uh, Say that the male persons who also receive MF should receive contraception. Actually, sorry, his partner should receive contraception. Also, as there may be strategic problems. Doctor Ahmed, yeah, and they advise the They advise even to to withdraw or stop MF at least six months before trying to to conceive. So okay. Uh, I thank you very much for your statements, but I want to refine your answer. We should separate. We are now dealing with women, women in child bearing period. We shouldn't use mycophenolic acid for those who are seeking for pregnancy. We allow pregnancy after transplantation by at least one, one year, year. The, and the optimum is two years after transplantation. And if we decide that it is safe to go for pregnancy, we should continue on contraceptive method until uh, and shifting from mycophenolic acid based regimen to other cell brain. And after six weeks at least of this shift, we can allow pregnancy without uh, sexual contact without contraception. This is for women and this is the standard of care all over the world. But regarding men, European Medical Agency in 2015 recommended that men who are transplanted and on immune suppressive drugs should have contraception too. So by, by the sex was condom because there is a, a threat of teratogenicity. And they recommend that condom should be maintained for 90 days after shifting to other sovereign if we allow sexual contact without condom to allow pregnancy. But early this year, there are some reports and letters in the transplantation journal stating and challenging this, this statement because the, the amount of mycophenolic acid reaching semen is very negligible. And there are more assuring study in the, in, from Norwegian, Norwegian experience showing this is the experience of Norwegian. And when they compared men who are on mycophenolic acid versus those who are not on mycophenolic acid, and they, all these men became fathers, they found no teratogenicity in kids. Uh, but as you mentioned in the uh, current guidelines that was released uh, on February this year, this is the recommendation. Male kidney transplant recipients are advised that mycophenolic acid containing compounds have theoretical, and this is the most, and I like this statement, th theoretical, no, but we should discuss with the, the patients. Theoretical teratogenic potential in men taking these agents. And the kidney transplant recipients should be advised that immature inhibitors, this regarding immature, it's another statement, uh, reduce the male sperm count and the counsel accordingly. So should be cautious about fertility and immune suppressive drug. And the for uh, male decision to conceive uh, continuum mycophenolic acid 
containing compound in a male kidney transplant recipient wishing to conceive should balance the risk of theoretical teratogenicity against the risk of rejection on changing the, from mycophenolic acid to other cyprin. So even we are not convinced by the teratogenicity of mycophenolic acid, we should have a professional consent with the patients. We should discuss with them these issues. But as I mentioned, the study from the week is assuring a little bit. Let's go to the another statement, another case scenario. This is a case of diarrhea in long-term kidney and pancreas recipient. Okay. The immune suppressive protocol included prednisolone, tacrolimus, and the mycophenolic uh, MMF, mofetel. The patient has chronic diarrhea. What are the causes of chronic diarrhea in kidney transplantation? What is the differential diagnosis? Here, maybe in this patient, uh, maybe drug-induced diarrhea, but the patient is receiving tacrolimus and the MMF, and uh, both drugs have the side effects of the GIT, GIT offset, and chronic diarrhea. Uh, maybe if you other. have current diarrhea, if you want, uh, the most important and the most smart way is to think of the most important then to be followed by drug. So the teaching point here, we should consider drug at the last thinking. So we should exclude the most grave first because you, you can have infection. infections, infection. malignancy, metabolic abnormalities. So if you request serology for the majority of infection like CMV, cholesteridium, etc. Uh, norovirus, rotavirus, all these are infections that is prevalent in some uh, in, in some land or another. And here we are aware of CMV. So we should ask for serology for these uh, infections. And searching for malignancy, including radiology, even endoscopy, and sometimes <coughs> biopsy if, if we are thinking of that. If there is nothing proven in all these investigations, we are left with drugs. And if we think of drugs, mycophenolic MMF is the most uh, plausible second uh, thinking, followed by tacrolimus. I want to ask you here a question before I proceed to the second question. If tacrolimus is associated with diarrhea, do you expect that the level is increasing or reduced by diarrhea, and why? Uh, there will be rise in the tacrolimus level. Is it rational or it is strange? It's a bit strange. But but, but there is but maybe there is uh, an explanation, as uh, there will be loss of the enterocytes during the area, and the enterocytes uh, contain the transporter. That is. Uh, so even if the enterocytes are not lost, if there is derangement of the enterocytes, the absorption is increased. Uh, this may be because of loss of the capacity of trans uh, exporter uh, to uh, get rid of the drug, so the drug is absorbed rapidly, and this is why with diarrhea we have the chromosomal level is high. Uh, so, if this is a case of mycophenolic acid, if there is a specific pathology for mycophenolic acid-related drugs, by the way, my, when I say mycophenolic acid-related, I mean MMF and mycophenolic sodium. Both of them can be incriminated in diarrhea. And I'm not convinced by the, that uh, mycophenolic sodium is superior in this issue. Yes, it may be superior in uh, pain, in the gastric pain, etc. But in diarrhea, it is related to mycophenolic acid. And both of them are pro drug. At the end, they release mycophenolic acid. That can lead to, Absolutely. and this is my question to you, what is the mechanism related to mycophenolic acid associated diarrhea? Is there a pathology? May cause ulceration in the colon. May lead to colitis, mycophenolic acid associated colitis, or villus atrophy. So this is the mechanism. If this is a scenario, and you excluded malignancy, and you are thinking of mycophenolic acid related or MMF related, what is the best treatment for this patient? Is to start lubramid, is to lower mycophenolate dose is to discontinue mycophenolate and maintain on tacrolimus and the prednisone, or switching mycophenolate to other cell brain. And why? So only one of these choices is right, and I want to know the explanation. Dr. Ahmed Tamal. 
I'll go with the lowering the MMF, the microphenolate, uh, the microphenolic acid dose at the beginning to decrease the extent of uh, colitis and the villus atrophy and uh, not to shift from the first step. Although it is possible and it's accepted to think of this strategy and because the majority of transplant physicians mm -hmm. doing the same, but be careful. Drastic reduction of uh, uh, MMF may be associated with catastrophic rejection. So, and here this is a case of kidney and pancreas transplantation. Mm -hmm. And we are afraid, very afraid of rejection. Mm -hmm. And this is a chronic diarrhea. And as I mentioned, the area here is related to the microphenolic acid related pathology within the gut. So it is better in this scenario shift. to shift to other cerebrain, to keep immune suppressive drugs within a window. Because if you reduce the, the, the dose of microphenolic acid at this time, if, that time, if you give full dose of other cerebrain and the patient tolerated it, it is better than continuing microphenolic MMF. So the best answer for this question is, is but uh, in our practice in kidney transplantation, if the patient is treated with two gram MMF and he is on tacrolimus, we take the opportunity that tacrolimus potentiate uh, MMF. So we'll start with reducing MMF to one gram. But below one gram, I'm not sure of the efficacy of this combination. So if the patient is treated with full dose two gram or equivalent from uh, microfluid sodium, uh, I can reduce so long as the patient is maintained with tacrolimus to one gram MMF or equivalent dose 770 of the uh, microfluid sodium. Below this level, I myself prefer to shift to other cerebrain. But if the case is kidney and pancreas, it's better to shift to from the start to guard against the risk of rejection. Okay. Uh, this is a case from uh, Professor Saad Al Ghamdi. Uh, also, this is a case of diarrhea after transplantation. The patient is receiving the same immune suppressive drugs. And if you read, the, uh, here the Professor Saeed uh, uh, studied the patient well. So the patient was subjected to a thorough investigation, including uh, investigation for parasites, for Clostridium difficile, the stool culture, blood culture, viral culture, CMV antigenemia, fiber optic gastroidinoscope, colonoscope, uh, and the colonoscope uh, almost shows almost normal appearance. So everything is negative. But because they are meticulous in this center, when they did biopsy, and the biopsy of the colon revealed this lesion, what is this? This is a mucosa, and there is attachment of cryptosporoidum. So when we diagnose crypto, we will give uh, baro, uh, baromycin, which is specific to this drug, so to this uh, organism. So this is why when you started your differential diagnosis by saying it is drug related, I asked the youth just to think it's more and more in the specific etiology. Yes, uh, the, the, uh, because if you put your hand on the specific etiology and you treat specifically, this will make a great difference. Another question. This is a patient who is transplanted, and immediately after transplantation, he suffered from a uh, chest problem, hypoxemia, and this is the radiological workup. <coughs> what do you think? What is the official diagnosis in this case? Here in the early post transplant period, uh, we think of infection, uh, especially pneumocystis pneumonia, PCP. Uh, there is bilateral, bilateral uh, infiltrates in both lungs. This immediate post transplantation, in the few days after transplantation. Mm -hmm. So this, the, if I if I see this appearance of radiology, I should think of infection. Mm -hmm. yes. So infection should be clarified, mm -hmm. bacterial, fungal, etc. Mm -hmm. So the patient was subjected to all the infection uh, workup, even including bronchoscopy and bronchoaver lavage, to see to to search for the etiology, and there was no. Infection, no documented infection. Maybe drug Which drug? Is my question to you. What what is what is specific drug that may lead to uh, this pneumonitis? Any inhibitor could cause pneumonitis. Is there another drug? So we, all of us are aware when a serulomus induced pneumonitis or a inhibitor related pneumonitis. 
Is there any class of amine suppressive drugs that may to pneumonitis or it is restricted to serolimus? I think only internal pneumonitis. No, this, is, this was a case of uh, MMF related pneumonitis. And after uh, discontinuing MMF, the, everything is resu uh, uh, becomes clear. And this is the appearance of the same patients after weeks of discontinuing yeah. MMF. So, yes, it is immature inhibitors, usually, uh, usually serolimus and pneumonitis, but maybe due to MMF. Yeah. Which is correct? This is a little bit <coughs> difficult question for you. Everolimus is associated with higher CMV viral infection. No. Why? Yeah, it's associated with lower incidence of CMV. Why? Uh, even one of the investigation drugs for the CMV. Why? I ask you I why. <laughs> and you are CMV man, I know. <laughs> I know you have a thesis about CMV. Yeah. Why Everlamus is not associated with higher CMV infection? Maybe it will have has an effect to decrease the replication. Yes, this is the answer. Because it it, it is immature inhibitor anti proliferative. Yes. The cell phase, G1 is also anti proliferative for the virus for the itself. Yes. Okay? Yes. Everolimus is associated with lower PK viral infection. Is it right or wrong? Right. The second statement. Everolimus is contraindicated if body mass index exceeds twenty eight kilograms per square meter. Not recommended, but I think not. If relumus starting dose is higher with tacrolimus than cyclosporine. Yeah. Okay. The sum level of everolimus and tacrolimus is 15. Everolimus and cyclosporine, 15. Okay. Okay. So uh, you didn't ta tackle the, 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 <laughs> the right answer. The right answer is. If relumus starting dose is higher with tacrolimus than cyclosporin. And I'll give you the evidence for all these statements. So this is this is the uh, study showing this is the uh, in, uh, meta-analysis including 28 randomized controlled trial. Here, if you look here, the CMV is significantly lower with immature inhibitors versus standard dose calcium inhibitors. In BK, there is no significant difference. But here, the significant difference was uh, in CMV. And here, in emitor plus reduced calcium inhibitor versus regular dose calcium inhibitor plus mycophilic acid, here, again, CMV is significantly lower with emitor inhibitor. And as I mentioned to you, it is through anti effect on CMV. Regarding the how to use Everlimus, I think this is one of the important articles I recommend all of you to read. It includes a recommendation for the use of Everolimus in the novicular kidney transplantation under the title False Beliefs, Myth and Realities. It's very interesting. If you go to the contraindication, so the relative contraindications include interstitial lung disease or severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease because we are afraid of uh, the aggravation of the pathology in the lung. Obesity was body mass index exceeding 35, not 28. Uh, the primary focal so, uh, segmental glomerular sclerosis as underlying etiology, as we do mm -hmm. in our center. A typical hemolytic hemolytic syndrome. Mm -hmm. And here, complete vascular, complex of vascular surgeries, renal arteries, uh, anastomosis, to, uh, et cetera. So it's difficulty mm -hmm. in the anastomosis, healing, healing, yes. and we are afraid of healing the problem need for the use of high doses and the elevated level of calcium inhibitors in cases of high immunological risk. And all these are accepted and we are applying all this point in our uh, center. This is very nice because this algorithm how to use. If tacrolimus is used, the uh, everolimus is used 1.5 every 12 hours because cyclosporin potentiate the level of everolimus. So if we use cyclosporin with Everolimus, the starting dose of Everolimus is 0.75 PID. Mm -hmm. But with tacrolimus, it should be 1.5. Why? Because cyclosporin reduces the metabolism of Everolimus. Mm -hmm. And this is not the case with tacrolimus. Mm -hmm. So with tacrolimus, it's better to start with higher dose. Mm -hmm. Regarding the level, very simple. The sum of tacrolimus level 
and epidermis should be ten. It's very simple, very simple rule. So in the early beginning, we want high level of tacrolimus. So it's, uh, it's better to leave tacrolimus around seven and the evrolimus around three. So this is a starting point. And after a period of time, we can shift tacrolimus to be three and the to, seven, to be seven. Using a little bit lower level, but not below three from evrolimus in the early beginning is beneficial to allow wound healing, etc., and to avoid side effects. And to continue with lower dose of tacrolimus to avoid tacrolimus related or calcium inhibitor related nephrotoxicity. Again, with tacrolimus, the starting dose is 1.5 twice five, but in cyclosporin, it's 1.75. Yes. And the sum rule is to keep both levels, the, comb the sum of the tacrolimus and the virulimus around 10. Okay. And this is the uh, some recommendation if you have pneumonitis, how to deal with a drug. So here, prevention, avoid high levels, avoid use this to prevent pneumonitis. Avoid the high level together because it is risky, uh, especially uh, if there is a problem in the chest. Avoid use in patients with severe lung disease. So this is how to prevent pneumonitis. If it is minor, Established effect, my, the patient presents with mild cough, <coughs> compatible uh, imaging, uh, this reduces the dose. But if you are dealing with serious infection, we should discontinue. It is clear. Regarding delayed wound healing, you can fix this slide and to read it uh, repeat, re uh, repeatedly because it carries good practice oriented. So avoid, so to prevent, avoid high levels. Avoid use in uh, obese patients with body mass index exceeding 35 because these are categories of patients who are risky for windy dehiscence. And here you can go through this wise approach. Uh, lymphocele, proteinuria, here proteinuria is very interesting for us. Avoid use in patients with primary focal segment agonosclerosis because uh, this Three. class of drugs may impair podocytes. So it may lead to may lead to podocytopathy. And if you have protonuria, protonuria less than one gram, maintain and combine renin angiotensin aldosterone system inhibitors. So if it is less than one gram, we can continue to avoid drastic change in immune suppressive protocol. Mm -hmm. But here it is wise to use RAS blockade or RAS inhibitors. If it is between one to three gram, reduce the dose and you continue RAS inhibitor. And if it exceeds two to three gram, biopsy and discontinue. Mm -hmm. And uh, myself, I am convinced by, if it is above one gram is to discontinue. And after no biopsy to search for the pathology or related, uh, either related or not related pathology. So above one gram, we should discontinue. But less than one gram, we can use uh, so long as creatinine is stable and, yeah, and other functions are stable, we can continue uh, this drug with S inhibitor or angiotensin blocker so long as the level is accepted. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I think we gained the experience here in the center because some of the studies done here uh, at certain time point, I think in 2001, we used a very high level of uh, serolimus exceeding 15 nanogram per ml. At the time, we may, yeah, we, we, uh, I think we uh, saw a lot of side effects. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we use level which is uh, with serolomus, with tacrolomus is 10. Mm -hmm. It's either uh, 3 to 7, so it is low target and, uh, and it is accepted. The last, the last point that I want to discuss with you today, uh, the regarding vitamin D. Clarify the interactions of a steroid calcium inhibitor with vitamin D. Is there an interaction with vitamin D? I don't think so. Do you think so? What is the interaction? What is the value of knowing vitamin D? Is there any risk of hypovitaminosis D in kidney transplantation? What, is, what are the side effects and the problems of hypovitaminosis D in kidney transplant recipients? Uh, the, What's your the expectation? The malabsorption is very... Uh, 
prevalent in the in patients. With I'm not asking you about the mechanism of hypovitaminosity. I, I ask you about what are the consequences of hypovitaminosity on transplantation, other graft, immunity, etc. Because vitamin D has uh, biotropic effects. Mm -hmm. So let us go just to see the answer. So this is an article showing the interactions of, with vitamin D. If you look here, this is these are the factors, and this is the mechanism of action of interference. If we look at the immune suppressive drug, which is the the our talk today, steroids increase the catabolism of vitamin D. Uh, calcium inhibitors suppress liver synthesis of vitamin D. So both both steroids and calcium inhibitors may be incriminated in the issue in the in hypovitaminosis, and this is just to show you that vitamin D is essential. Although we need further studies to prove this figure, but I want to clarify the figure for you. If we say that chronic allograft dysfunction, which is the cumbersome problem that we face in transplantation is related to all these scenarios, recurrence or de nouveau, glonephritis, calcium inhibitor nephrotoxicity, the use of drugs, chronic antibody mediated rejection, uh, uh, EFTA, uh, inflammation, metabolic conditions like uh, uh, this uh, hyperuricemia, um, anemia, dyslipidemia, acidosis, infection, UTI, BK, CMV, HCV. Here, all these are the famous causes of chronic aurex function. Okay? Yes. All the, all the, here, the backgrounds, dark backgrounds, squares are counteracted by vitamin D. So vitamin D has beneficial effects and, uh, against hypertension, against infection, against UTR, against PK. So this is the, because it has biotropic effect, has better metabolic profile, and is, uh, is, is there are some uh, papers showing antiproteinuric and to reduce the progression of uh, allograft function and against the, the immunity, the hypovitamin D uh, disrupt the immunity and stimulate the immunity and it is an, a risk is a risk for T cell mediated rejection and here antibody mediated rejection. So, putting in consideration, hypovitamin D is important, but as I said, we need randomized control studies to prove this association, but it is confirm it from observation, etc. But we need further uh, proof. At the end, I thank you very much, and this is the my symbol of life, is I'm continuing learning, because I, I feel living through learning. Even if I'm teaching, I am learning through teaching. And I hope that uh, you get some benefit from this discussion, and hoping to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.